Hello and welcome to the Great Lakes Fishing Podcast. Today we're joined by Jay Wesley. Jay is the Lake Michigan Basin Coordinator for the Michigan DNR. Jay, welcome to the show. Thank you, Chris. Glad to be here. Yeah, thanks for coming on. Uh, I kind of want to do something kind of a state of the lake. I know, uh, especially with the temperatures that we've had this year, people are really chomping at the bit to get out on the lake right now and get started get started fishing this year. Um, let's just kind of go through and talk about kind of what people can expect this year, and we'll kind of go by seat, by species. Um, what do you kind of see as the state of, of the Lake Michigan king salmon population and what people can uh, expect for fishing along the Michigan shoreline this year? Yeah, I think, Chris, we'll see numbers are, will be up um, because we are stocking more Chinook salmon now than we have in the cut last couple of years, and wild production is up. So I saw some estimates of almost 8 million wild Chinooks contributing to the fishery. So I think your, your catch rates should be up better than last year, at least the same. The size of the Chinook are going to be going down. Um, we we don't quite have the alewife biomass that we did a couple of years ago. But on the flip side, we did see a really good year class, 2023 year class of alewife. So I think there's enough that they survive well, and they should, because it's been a relatively mild winter that um, we, sh- we should have some good fishing next year. I know that was something, you know, that was the argument against. I know people really want to see more stocking. The argument against that is always, well, we need to make sure that we have the biomass. We need to make sure they're a predator. We need to make sure that there's prey out there for them. Um, do you see us heading to that spot where maybe there's just not enough there for those fish to forage on? Yeah, we're watching it closely. I think we hit rock bottom in 2015. Um, and that's when we had to make those hard decisions to reduce stocking. And it, it worked. I think luck was part of it. We got a couple of year classes of alewife. So we started to build that alewife biomass, the prey biomass again. And that allowed us to then increase stocking. So if we see that alewife biomass continues to go down, we have this thing called a predator prey ratio. If we get to a point where we start to get nervous again, we're gonna we're gonna drop stocking. I know it's not popular, but I hope we've showed that it's the right thing to do and it'll keep the lakes more stable in the long run. If we push this to the limits, you know, we just don't know what will happen. So um, but I think we're in a good place right now. We've seen species like lake trout kind of change um what they're what they prey upon you see a lot more lake trout going after goby do you see that in salmon populations is there another prey species that they key in on when alewife aren't present unfortunately for chinook salmon no they're 99 percent going after alewife they will go after smelt when they're around um but if there's alewife present they're going to chase those alewife down um Steelhead will eat bugs on the surface, but when there's alewife around, they're, you know, you look at their diets, they're up in the 90% range for alewife, um, and, and same for coho. So when we have good alewife numbers, all three of those species do well. The only one that seems to change a little bit is brown trout. So they spend a little bit more time on the bottom, and we see a little bit more goby action with them, just like the lake trout. Well, let's talk about cohos a little bit. Uh, you say that king salmon look really good this year on Lake Michigan. What do you have for coho? Yeah, we're still stocking the same amount. I think last year the coho started out small in size early spring, but then uh, they kind of equaled out uh, throughout the season. So their growth rates were good, and we actually saw quite a few what we call jacks showing up at the weirs. So that means they're growing really well. So I would expect coho this spring to be – uh, larger than what they were last year, and hopefully they had good overwinter survival as well. So I'm anxious to get out there. I was out there in February last year getting coho, so I think it's going to be the same same type of thing this year. If you can get out on Southern Lake Michigan, you know, unless the weather changes, you'll probably be able to get out this February. Yeah. So how do you see that kind of playing out this year? Um, not a lot of ice coverage, and it doesn't look to be changing anytime soon either. The forecasts right now are really showing uh, a lot of warm weather in the future. So what do you, I mean, do you expect that to have an effect? I guess, A, on how the fish kind of get through the winter. Is 
is the weather um does that have any kind of bearing on how those fish get through the winter and b you know fishing pressure if it starts early does that affect things later on in the year yeah so i think the fish will tend to stay shallower this year because of the weather when the winter conditions are harsh our salmonids tend to go to the middle of the lake where things are more stable so i think they'll show up if they haven't some of them probably haven't even left at all but i think they're going to show up earlier this spring and so you might want to change your kind of mental clock they might be showing up in new buffalo or st joe a little bit earlier than they have in the past so just be aware of that and then they tend to peter out you know once we get into june anyway until the fall run sets up but i i think i'm expecting coho fishing to be really good this spring all right let's talk a little bit of lakers um i know that's a big part of the catch throughout the year in a lot of different ports on Lake Michigan. What's going on with Lake Michigan Lake Trout this year? Yeah, the last two years, Lake Trout catch rates have been lower, um, which is concerning some of our charter guys and, and some of the folks that like to target Lake Trout. I'm, I'm not sure if it's a population reduction or if they're just staying out deeper for whatever reason. Um, we do have gobies um, that they're feeding on. We've also had pretty good year classes of what's called a bloater chub and they tend to stay out deeper. So I got to see this play out, whether the, the lake trout just aren't coming in shallow like they normally would early spring, or you know, some of our researchers and modelers are suggesting a, a population decrease. Um, and in 2015, we, we eliminated a lot of our stocking sites in Southern Lake Michigan. Wisconsin reduced the, uh, uh, quite a bit on the Mid Lake Reef. So maybe we're starting to see the effects of that. And if that's the case, I'm really hoping some wild fish um, fill in behind them um, so we can maintain, you know, at least a consistent lake trout fishery. And browns are really popular, especially in the early part of the season. Uh, what do you guys have for brown trout this year on tap? Yeah, browns really have suffered with the changes in the lake conditions. You know, when, when our total alewife numbers went down, our brown survival did as well. Um, but the last two years, we've started to see catch rates come up. And so we're trying to focus our stocking in the areas which we think are doing well. So that's mostly Ludington, Manistee, and a couple of ports north. We eliminated all the southern ports, but we're starting to see, even though we don't stock in the south, we're seeing catch rates of browns go up. So we, we decided to add another southern port. So we'll be putting 20,000 browns in Grand Haven. So hopefully that'll... Um, get that pier fishery and early spring fishery going again. Well, one question that people have, I think, all the time when we talk about, you know, how many fish are in the lake and these types of things is, how do you guys monitor that? Um, when when you're taking a look and assessing things on the lake and we're kind of doing a general overview type of thing, but how does the DNR in Michigan assess the fish populations and, and what will be out there every year? Yeah, the best thing we have are called statistical catch at age models, and they will look at um, agency caught fish. So we have, you know, not only Michigan has a research vessel, the other states do as well. And so they we have a lake wide monitoring program. So what we find in our assessment nets is part of it. Um, charter boats report. So we use their reporting, their catches and harvest on all the species throughout the year. So charter boat harvest reports are very important to us. We have a creel survey at major ports, so that helps us keep track of numbers. And then we have weir returns as well. Um, so all of it combined and um, some, some magical statistics and different formulas, we can come up with the uh, population estimates for most of our fish species. Can you give me a little detail on those, on those weir returns? How, how does that, how do those work? Yeah, so, <clears throat> Um, for example, we take eggs um, at the Little Manistee Weir for Chinook and Steelhead. So we handle fish there. So we got a, at least an idea of the numbers of fish coming through. We probably got a better handle of the Chinook population for Steelhead. You know, we're just grabbing fish until we make an egg take and then we open the weir up. Other weirs um, such as Medusa um, or Platt, we get a more complete counts. So um, all of our coho come back up to the, the plat there where we do most of our stocking. So we get a, 
account at the lower weir, um, which is really helpful too. So it just helps us monitor the numbers from year to year. Very good. Uh, last fall, there was a change in the Treaty of 1836 decree. It opens up, uh, I guess I'd say, uh, more aggressive netting policies for the tribes. Can you talk a little bit about that and, and what anglers can expect? One, to see on the lake when they're out there, but how you think it'll affect the fishery? Yeah, so they might see a little bit more netting activity in Grand Traverse Bay and, and maybe a little bit more around Manistee and Ludington. Um, we still have catch quotas or harvest quotas for both the tribal fishers and recreational fishers. So that's what's really going to continue to monitor the fishery. So if, if we see populations going down, then the quotas will go down. So um, they may get to their quota quicker with more gear out there. It's still hard to tell, um, but we'll have to see how it plays out. Some of these tribes may not use uh, the gear that they are allowed to. Um, it just depends on their fisher. So rumor has it that the um, Little River Band may not use much gill net around Ludington Manistee. They have the right to use it, but we'll have to see if they actually do. So anglers at least will have to be cognizant that there could be nets out there. Um, we always encourage good net marking, but, uh, and they, the Little River Band's been really good about um, notifying the Charter Boat Association. They post where the nets are at. Um, that's mostly with a trap net, which they're using right now. So their trap net fisher has been great working with the angling community. So again, it's something that, that you guys are just going to keep an eye on and kind of keep your finger on the pulse of what's happening there. Absolutely. I mean, on the flip side, if, you know, our catch rates on, you know, lake trout go really high from lots of anglers being out there, you know, we have to reduce basically our overall harvest too. So those are things that we monitor. And if we have to do that, we may have to reduce the bag limit or reduce the season. So that's how we effectively manage the fishery. It's not really the gear or the number of anglers that are out there. So. All right. Speaking of changing the regulations, there's a, uh been some changes to regulations on a few rivers uh, on Lake Michigan concerning steelhead, dropping some of those bag limits down. Um, it, it's something again that people are are looking at, but this is something that the Michigan Natural Resources Commission approved, but maybe the, the folks like you on the DNR side, not quite sure about uh, whether or not this is the right call. Can you talk a little bit about that for us? Yeah, steelhead, just like Chinook, um, what we've seen with browns, um, they are mostly affected by what's going on in Lake Michigan. So if we have half the amount of bait out there, we can only support half the population. And steelhead's a great example. I think when you look at our model, models, we were up to, you know, at the high point, maybe 4 million steelhead out in Lake Michigan. And since 2004, when we got the quagga mussels coming in, we were down to about 2 million steelhead. So we agree there's less steelhead, but then you have to ask why. And I think the why is because we just don't have the capacity to maintain the population what we did, did have. So I think, um, you know, there's probably fewer fish coming into some of these rivers than historic, historically. Um, some of these anglers that, that are diehards are seeing more people coming out for steelhead. It used to be you know, winter steelhead fishing was for um, the crazies out there that didn't mind freezing, you know, um, fishing for these these fish, but it's become a lot more popular. Um, so I think this is more of a, um, people who love to steelhead fish are just concerned with the numbers. So they wanna preserve the numbers that are in the river and in effect, um, what I call recycle fish more. So if you got people releasing most of their fish, there's an opportunity for, for an angler the, another day down the road to catch that fish as well. So I think that's mostly what's driving it. Um, harvest in our rivers is not an issue. And that's what we tried to explain to the NRC, but they, they approach it as, you know, what harm will this do? Um, if anything, we might see higher catch rates from it. So at least you're not by making this regulation change, you're not driving the population down even further. You're actually preserving the adults that are there um, for more to catch. Yeah, there was a lot of debate on this topic, a lot of back and forth through a bunch of different user groups. Um, 
Do you feel like those river anglers, those guys that are going out, guys and gals that are going out and doing the river thing, um, do you think that they like this idea? You think that that most of them are in favor? And like you say, you know, are, are these are these the type of folks who like to fill the creel, or are they the type of folks who just want to go out and and enjoy catching the fish? Yeah, it depends on who you who you ask. I think the the anglers that are engaged that um, you know are willing to come to meetings, they're more of your catch and release folks anyway. Um, so they're very supportive of conservative type regs. Um, it's more about the experience for them than taking a fish home. What we have a hard time doing is connecting with people who aren't as active in the community. So just the average angler that wants to show up on a river and if they, if they get on some fish, they want to take them home. Um, and they don't attend our meetings as much. They don't take surveys. So we don't really know what their values are, or what they really like to see in a fishery. So um, it makes it difficult for us because, you know, when, when we are in the field, we hear from those anglers or our creel clerks hear from those anglers and they get quite upset that their opportunity has been decreased because, uh, you know, they can only keep one per day now. Well, let's talk about uh, Arctic grayling. This is something that hasn't been present in Michigan for a long, long time, but it's a project that the Michigan DNR has been working on now for, I don't know, five or six years and trying to reintroduce Arctic grayling. I think it's a, a really cool project and it's kind of gets me excited. Uh, can you talk a little bit about that reintroduction program and, and what you're doing there? Yeah, I think the last one was caught in the 1930s and then we tried to do some half-hearted restoration attempts um, in the mid mid 80s, late 80s, um, and then it just kind of died down. We haven't heard much um, interest in Arctic grayling at all. But uh, some of our tribal partners were interested in some sort of reintroduction because they are important native species to Michigan. And there's been other work done in other states like Montana where they've figured out new ways of stocking fish and it's actually stocking fertilized eggs into habitats where um, Arctic grayling can live. And they've seen great success with that. So that was enough um, kind of new information that um, we were able to rally around. We got over 50 partners now in the initiative and everyone's pretty excited about it. So we're putting a lot of work into doing habitat assessments and figuring out where the best rivers are in Michigan that could support Arctic grayling again. So that's where we're at. Um, we've we've got um, your classes or what we call broodstock up at our Marquette State Fish Hatchery. And we had enough of them or an a access of them um, where we were able to stock the 20, some of the 2019 and 2021 extra year classes out of their broodstock. So we, we stocked three lakes with adult grayling this year. So you can actually go in Michigan and catch grayling. And I've heard of people already catching them out of some of these lakes. Yeah, I want to get into that in a second. But basically what you're doing then with this program is turning your, your hatcheries into, instead of, you know, creating these hatchlings to put out there, you're just turning them into egg factories to create eggs to, to put in the rivers. That's kind of the plan. Yeah. Um, our mistake previously is we stocked yearlings and fall fingerlings and they can't home into a certain area, so they just tend to leave and never come back to those areas to spawn. Where the Montana experience is fertilized eggs in the stream, um, and they will find their way back and hopefully use that habitat to spawn in the future. So yeah, all of our production is going to be eggs, and we'll work with our partners, tribal partners. They're going to have uh, remote site incubators out. We're going to have egg trays out. Um, so we're going to try all kinds of different methods and, and see what works for us. That's really cool. But yeah, you guys have some brood stock you're, you're putting into some lakes up in the UP. Um, what is what is that going to be like as far as people having fishing opportunities? We've been talking about uh, stocking numbers in Lake Michigan in the hundreds of thousands, but we're talking about hundreds of fish here uh, going into some of these lakes. What kind of fishing opportunity do you think that those will really present? Yeah, that will be catch and release only. It's still illegal to possess uh, Arctic grayling, but you can fish for them. Um, like Pentagore Lakes in Houghton County, uh, uh, West Johns Lakes in Elger County, uh, Pentagore got 300 fish, adults, um, West Johns got 400, 
Pine Lake is in Manistee County. It's a little bit bigger lake. It got about 1,200. And what's interesting, I was at the Pine Lake stocking, and I think two days after we stocked them, those fish spread out in the lake, and a guy was, I think, bluegill fishing or something out there late fall and uh, ended up catching a couple. So they are um, vulnerable to angling. You know, they'll, they'll hit jigs and different things just like all other fish. So I think you have a pretty good chance going to one of these lakes um, and, and catching a grayling. That's to me, really exciting and something that I think people are, are going to want to do, even if it's only in a few areas. Um, let's talk a little bit. You talked about the steelhead thing and how that's growing and people want to do that more. Um, one of the things that I do, and maybe I'm a junkie for this, but I, I watch a lot of YouTube and I'm looking for adventure style fishing and, and things like, you know, we're going to go up to the UP and we're going to camp for three days in winter camping and go out and do fishing. You know, do you see that as where some of this growth and some of these kind of niche style fishing opportunities is growing from people just being exposed to it through things like YouTube? Absolutely. Um, before it had to be friends or family that were introducing you to the sport and how to fish for them. And, and now, yeah, you can learn about anything you want through YouTube and, you know, center pin fishing, float fishing, bead fishing, all of that has really exploded, you know, the last five, 10 years. So I see a lot more people, you know, I fish the Kalamazoo River and mostly boat fish just because it's a big river. But man, I see people on the banks all the time and they're float fishing. So I, I know that particular part of the sport has really grown, um, which is great to see. You know, it's these are younger folks that I'm seeing, you know, people in their teens, 20s, early 30s doing it. Um, so that's like an exciting part of our fishery that these younger folks are getting involved with it. So, but yeah, if you can make it a, an adventure out of it, you know, I've seen people hunting and steelhead fishing at the same time, floating down rivers. So, yeah, there's a lot you can do with it and, you know, you can make it into whatever adventure you want. Yeah, do you see that becoming somewhat of a, I guess, a friction point? I mean, one of the things that we see Western, you know, you used to be able to go antelope hunting in Wyoming pretty easily, but because people see how easy it is and how accessible it is, now it's not as easy and as accessible because there's just more people wanting to do that. Um, where do you see that friction coming in with something like, you know, going out and center pinning rivers or doing the fall steelhead thing? Yeah, I think um, people are seeing uh, catch rates go up where it used to be, you know, you're out fishing half the day in 15 degree weather. And if you got one hookup or two, you're pretty happy. But with the center pin float fishing, you know, people are having, you know, multiple hookups a day, sometimes 10, 15 fish days. So I think people see that and it makes them nervous about the fishery. But I guess from a biological standpoint, we don't have any evidence that that those kind of catch rates are hurting the population at all. But from a social perspective or just from the optics of it, I know it concerns some people. I appreciate it. He's Jay Wesley from the Lake Michigan Basin Coordinator from the Michigan DNR. And uh, Jay, I really appreciate you coming on. And it's one of those things with you. It's like, I see you out in the forums, you're doing a great job just getting out and talking to people and being a great voice for the fishery and for your agency. Yeah, I appreciate that, Chris. And if anyone's got questions out there, don't hesitate to get a hold of me.